All right. He's the host of Pod Save the People. He's done a lot of good stuff. He was on this podcast probably 10 weeks ago. It hadn't been meaning to have you on again. I didn't realize um, that all of a sudden we would have some timely stuff to talk about. But DeRay McKesson, um, first of all, how are you? I'm good. You know, it's a wild time. Uh, it seems like it is only getting more wild, uh, but I'm okay. I think that we have a real chance to win in this lifetime, and I believe that. So I'm like doubling down on it. So last time you were here, you hadn't, you, you were getting the A Can't Wait going and really had gone up a level with educating the public about different things with the police and what was going on. And you had immediate impact and success with that. Just tell us what the last like 10, 11 weeks have been like. Yeah, so A Can't Wait was a big success. Uh, in the 100 largest cities, we've seen about 80, 85 of the 100 largest cities uh, adopt at least one policy or in the process of adopting a policy, uh, which is huge. You know, it's like one of those things that, that is unprecedented in American history. You think about the ban on chokeholds and strangleholds, like a ban on all neck restraints. When we initially started, there are only 28 cities in the United States that banned all neck restraints. Uh, since then, 33 more cities have either outright banned them and 26 cities in addition to that are in the process of banning them. So there are only wow. 13 cities in the 100 largest cities that have not uh, either banned them or in the process. So it's unprecedented. This is more changes than have ever happened in American history, uh, more changes with regard to restricting or reducing the power of the police. Uh, and it is, it's a big win. We know it's a beginning though, right? Like this isn't, this is one step. There are a host of other things that need to happen, which is why we're working on police unions now. But uh, over 300 cities, Bill, have been impacted by a can't wait. Uh, it is more, the federal government can only intervene in three police departments a year. We've done 300 cities in 60 days, which is, uh, which is wild. So most people, they think like when, when you're pushing progress like this, it's like, oh man, it'll get bogged down. It's going to take forever. How have you been able to find some shortcuts to get this to move in a much, much faster way? So what we realized is like with these use of force policies, like requiring de-escalation, making a duty to intervene, banning chokeholds, banning shooting into moving vehicles, is that there are matters of policy in almost all the cities in the country. So the mayor just has the power to do it or the police chief has the power to do it. And like there are not a whole lot of things that don't require votes or legislation, but this is one of them. Uh, and when we started this project in 2015, like that was what appealed to us is like they could actually make this change overnight. And a lot of places actually did. So there are, you know, Louisville, Louisville, you know it because Breonna Taylor got killed in Louisville. They're actually about to vote on a, a set of the eight, like to restrict the power of the police there. They, as you know, uh, they did ban no knock raids, which is also a, a good thing that they did. Um, so, so these changes could happen quickly, and they did, which is cool. Not everything could happen this quick, uh, but this was movable. So the stuff you're doing is obviously a little bit controversial. Um, you're going to get criticized like, oh, this can't work or why do they do it this way? Is there a fair criticism of anything that you've tried to do so far that made you rethink like, oh yeah, that's actually, they, there's something to that? Or, or do you feel like a lot of the stuff you're doing is just unassailable? Well, I think that people, I, I think that what is true is that there's no one solution that gets us to zero, right? Moving the money, uh, you know, decreasing police budgets alone won't end police violence. Uh, changing the use of force policies alone won't end police violence, right? Like uh, undoing some of the carceral state won't end police. Like this is both and, not either or. And I think there were some people who thought we were saying this is the fix, right? Like this is the thing. And like, it's not. And we knew that going in, that this is the floor, not the ceiling. This is saying like, these are basic things that need to be in place. They're not in place. A lot of people think they're in place. Like, I, you'd be shocked, Bill, about the number of people who thought chokeholds and neck restraints were banned, and they weren't, right? right? They just aren't. So one of the criticisms we got, a heavy one, they were like, you know, chokeholds have been banned in New York City, and Garner still got killed. And you're like, chokeholds were banned. Strangleholds were not banned. That is why we're calling for a ban on all of them, right? So, like, so that was, you know, so if people thought that we were saying that this was the answer— then like we weren't, right? We were saying this is one of the answers because we know no one strategy is is good enough to get us. So when we think about like this question of like, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time, right? P Some people can interpret that to mean one bite after another, which is incrementalism. When I hear that, I think about like, 
all these people biting at the same time, right? It's like, it is everybody, but it's like a million strategies all on this big target at one time. Like that's what we need to do, right? So to fund the police is one of the, one of the things that got a lot of steam this summer. And to me, I think people get caught on defunding the police versus um, diffusing the power of police unions. Can you explain in your opinion, the difference between those two things? Yeah, so that's the thing is I don't think that this is about uh, an either or. I don't think this is like a sort of versus. Well, what I what what I think is true is that the police unions have a huge amount of leverage in every aspect of discipline, accountability, and what most people don't realize is with regard to the budgets themselves. So, like, I don't know if you knew uh, that there are some of the major police unions in the country actually got pandemic money, PPP money. They got huge uh, amounts of money from the federal government which is wild because, like, they don't need money. There's no layoffs happening at police departments. Uh, but even more importantly, there are a lot of contracts, police union contracts across the country, that make it impossible for cities to really decrease the budget. So the Seattle City Council was, they said they were going to cut the police budget by 50%. Okay, let's do it. They started to do the cuts and realized they could not do cuts like that without engaging the police union contract. It was impossible. The reason why the officers who killed Breonna Taylor couldn't be suspended immediately without pay, they're still not suspended without pay, is because the contract prohibits it, right? In places like uh, Columbus, Ohio, in Columbus, the contract says that you can't civilianize the work of the police department. So you couldn't transition current police duties to civilians, to non-police without engaging the police union contract. So like when I think about defund, when I think about moving the money away from police, when I think about investing in alternatives, what we saw from a structural level is that in almost all the cities, it is impossible to actually do the transformative thing you want around the budget without dealing with the police union contract in the first place, right? Which is why we launched Nix to Six, which is the biggest database of police union contracts in the country. And there are 20 states that actually have police officer bill of rights at the state level that provide protection. So you know Kenosha because the latest killing that went viral was in Kenosha or the latest shooting was in Kenosha. Kenosha, small town in Wisconsin, the Kenosha police union contract has a police officer bill of rights that gives the police special protections during interrogations. That's wild. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good test case for this, right? If we're going to make progress in all these things, how do you do it when it's like, then you have a Kenosha, which is like, it's not one of the hundred biggest cities that, you know, you're dealing with. We have so many cities and towns in these places. Do you feel like it's just going to be impossible to have some sort of common framework that could deal with all cities, big and small? No, I don't think it's impossible at all. I think that, you know, this is why we focus so heavily on the data to lead us is that you think about Kenosha, uh, what the data shows us is that the police kill more people in suburban communities than almost all other communities combined. So Kenosha is more representative of where the problem is than most of the cities you see on TV. Wauwatosa is another place in uh, Wisconsin. In Wauwatosa, there's one officer who's killed anybody in the past five years. He has killed three people in the past five years. He got a medal for killing the first person. Jesus. He got suspended for killing the second person. And he's under investigation for the third. Wauwatosa has like 50,000 people in it. I just had a call with the Wauwatosa organizers last week. Is these towns, Kenosha, Wauwatosa, they are... Wauwatosa. It's Wauwatosa. Lord, every time I say Wauwatosa, people are like, it's, it's Wauwatosa. Sorry. <laughs> Wauwatosa. Uh, I just called the Wauwatosa organizers uh, the other day. Is... Um, is that these towns, these suburbs are more representative of like where the problem is most acute. Uh, so our solutions have to hit those places. So what kind of, uh, so this, I'm trying to remember the exact week you came out. I think it was the first week of June when you were here. And yeah, I think yeah, you're, uh, I think your profile raised in a couple different ways um, over the next few weeks. And I know you have you know, famous people, celebrities, people in positions of power that are reaching out to you, asking you to talk to small groups, um, spend some of your time educating different people. What, out of all those interactions, what, what's been the most memorable or surprising to you? Um, just of different groups of people that you've talked to. Oh, th this is an easy question. So, uh, there, so in Pasco County, Florida, there's a group of women, mostly women and like a couple guys, like eight of them who emailed and they were like, Hey, they thought my account was like a fake account. So they're like, Hey, you know, this is for DeRay, but, but you know, if somebody can read our use of force policy, cause Pasco County is a collection of places with police departments and not one of the biggest hundred cities. So 
her name is Keisha, and I um and I reply, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Like, can't wait to be there. And they're like, really? And I'm like, oh yeah, I can't wait to do it. I hop on Zoom with them. And when I tell you, Bill, they were ready. They got their use of force policy. They had read it all. They were like, you know, I'd read it too. And I was like, here's where I think it falls on the eight. And they were like, we disagree with you, DeRay. And I'm like, I love it, right? Like they totally took it. They ran with it. They're fighting their police departments now about it. Like they were a really good example of like build a framework People can use it, and like they knocked it out. There's another. There's a young, a young man, 16 year old in Needham, Massachusetts. Same thing. He emails me at like 11 p.m. He's like, "Hey, I'm gonna be with the police chief soon. Can you help?" We hop on the phone. We walk through the use of force policy. He wants to talk about the contract and all this other stuff, and then he just runs with it, right? And like that's how we got to over 300 cities in 60 days, is because people like took the information. There was a mayor in California. She emailed us probably week three, and she's like, "To whom this may concern." We got, she's like, I got 3,000 emails. You have flooded my inbox. Can you please do a petition so people stop emailing? I get it. And we're like, no, we want people to stress you out until you <laughs> fix the policies, right? Uh, so those are by far like the best interactions we've had. And as Steve Kerr talked about how you talked to all the NBA coaches on a Zoom. That must oh, have did been, he tell you that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He talked about it on a, on his uh, Flying Coach podcast, yeah. So you talked to, oh, that's so you talked to all three of the coaches because they've been, I think really, um, really uh, not aggressive. I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, proactive. Um, with they how were, to get they involved with stuff. They were great. So the coach of the Mavericks, um, Rick Carlisle, I think, you know, great. He's great. Uh, I don't even know what city the Mavericks are. <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he is great. I talked to him and like, he, he's such a good example of like, he called, um, and when I tell you he knows that policy, I mean, he knows it. Like, he was like, you know, I went in the meeting and da-da-da. And, and it's like, you don't, you don't really need me. Like, right. I'm, making, I'm, I'm making you feel comfortable. But what you just said is, like, spot on. Like, I mean, he just, like, nailed it. And he, he got it. I can't even, I can't, like, sing his praises enough. Like, he really understood it. But he was a good example of, like, this work is not too complicated for anybody to learn. And, like, we know it well because we do this all day, every day, but everybody can know it well. And part of our responsibility is to help people understand it. And like the coach that he, you know, I had a call with him probably a couple of weeks ago uh, where he called for it. He was calling to just check in and it was like, you got it, guy. Like you like he has it, you know, yeah. so he's a gold standard. All right. So we're taping this. It's like 2.30 on Thursday afternoon Pacific time. The NBA decided to um, that they're going to resume play this weekend. It seemed a little dicey last night. I was, I was actually wondering if it was, but that the season was potentially going to get canceled. I, I think a lot of those guys were in pain and they were confused and trying to figure out why they spent the last four or five weeks, not only trying to bring basketball back to, but to use their platform to make this huge statement. And then we get another shooting and it's like, what am I doing here? If, the, if you had, as they're trying to figure this out on Wednesday night, and they have this huge meeting. All the players are in a huge ballroom with the coaches. They eventually ask the coaches to leave. If you had just been there as like a conciliary, as they're trying to figure out how do we use our platform? What should we care about here? Because it was, it was obvious they want to provoke some sort of change. But as you know, in America, it's hard to just snap your fingers and make seven things happen. So if they looked at you and they said, Help us. What what should we care about short term and long term? What would you tell them? Yes, yeah, so the only thing I'll say to frame this is I'm going to push on this idea that it's hard to snap your fingers and make change because if Trump has showed us anything, he has showed us that the government can move as quick as it wants to, right? <laughs> That's fair. Who thought you could just rip up mailboxes? Like he's ripping up mailboxes, right. right? Or like banning whole people from the country on Twitter. You're like, I didn't even know that was possible, right? But he has, this administration has been a reminder that like if we want to do it, we could do it, right? Uh, when I think about what I would say to the NBA players, one would be, is there a way for your, whatever the community apparatus for the team is to check in for some local demands? Cause like, you know, there are 18,000 police departments and most of this stuff sort of matters differently at the local level. But in terms of things that across the board are important, there are a couple of things that I'd say. One is in the 20 states that have officer bill of rights, we need to repeal them. Like they just gotta go. Uh, the oldest one is in Maryland. It's from the seventies. The newest one, you probably don't know that Georgia actually wrote, passed and voted on a law, an officer bill of rights during the last protest after George Floyd got killed. Whoa. After Ray Shar Brooks got killed, Georgia passed an officer bill of rights. So like they all gotta go. None of them have ever been repealed. And like, 
the only reason they survive is that people don't know they exist. And the clauses in them, like in Louisiana, officers get 30 days before they can be interrogated. Like the the... You know, in Maryland, the law says that you can't file an anonymous complaint of brutality against a police officer. So if a police officer beats somebody up or kills somebody, uh, it cannot be an anonymous complaint. So there are all these things that are bad in these laws. So that would be one is for them to publicly come out and say we should undo those. For them to, wherever their city is, to work to make sure that the police union doesn't have the power to intervene in discipline, accountability, those sort of frameworks. I think we can ban no-knock raids. There's no need for them across the country. Uh, and ending qualified immunity. Uh, we can do it at the state level. The Supreme Court's probably not going to do it for a long time. Federal government's not going to do it for until we get Congress back. But the states can ban qualified immunity immediately. And those four things, I think, are things that would actually change the outcomes. Because here's the thing. The police have killed 751 people uh, so far this year in 235 days, right? Like, it is... It's unrelenting, but those four things combined, and some separately, would actually help us lessen the numbers. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get to zero. I think what you laid out makes sense with the framework of the NBA, because basically you're saying it's not some sweeping thing that would be, oh, we'll do this and it'll be for the whole nation. You actually have to each take care of your own city and your state where the players and the coaches and the owners have immense sway. You know, you look at the Celtics, they have... I don't know, four famous guys, maybe five that could be on the ground in the cities. Um, you have an ownership group that has a lot of money. That's all local. Um, you have a team that's super famous. And if they just try to like, we're going to take care of Massachusetts, you guys worry about your things and everybody's kind of splitting up the territory. It would seem like that would be the easiest way to provoke change because I still feel like the guys matter the most where they play over anywhere else. They're, they're going to have the biggest impact there. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So here's the thing about the criminal justice stuff. There are some things that can only be, be fixed nationally. Like healthcare is a national thing, right? Like the federal government has to do that. We think about like food stamps, med like those things are national. Like the federal government does that better than anybody. The criminal justice stuff is almost all local. There are 18,000 police departments. The federal government has very little ability to do anything to them besides give them money or restrict money. Like that's it. That's really the only oversight. And then when we think about prisons and jails, it's like there are around 250,000 people incarcerated in the federal system. There are 1.8 million people incarcerated in state and local jails. Like it is, this is a heavily local, like this is local, you know? So that is the single biggest thing that people can do is like, we have to fight this locally to get the big wins. And like, I do believe we can get them. I think you're right that the more and more that people focus on the local stuff, like we'll get it. The federal government, like the Justice and Policing Act is more good than it's bad. Um, but again, like the real big changes will come at the local level. Yeah, because it was interesting reading some of the stuff that trickled out of the meetings yesterday where they're like, the players want more from the owners, they want more from the leagues, but they couldn't totally identify what they wanted. They just, they know they want something. And it would seem like really they want a plan and they want advice on stuff and like some sort of strategy. And I, I think that's where, I don't want to say they've stumbled, but it's just really complicated. You know, it's, you're talking about a local strategy. You're talking about a countrywide strategy. I think one of the things that they've gotten momentum on is voter reform. Um, and some of the stuff LeBron's done been great, but do you feel like voter reform and police reform should almost go hand in hand here? Yeah, so voting is important, right? We think about voting as like a tool in the toolbox and there's no way to build the house you want without using all the tools, right? So, uh, will the tool of voting build the house? No, there's no one tool that'll build the whole house. But do you need this tool to build the house you want? Absolutely, right? So that's how I think about voting is that like we need the end of qualified immunity, no knock, the end of officer bill of right, all that stuff. They are all the tools in the toolbox. And if we don't use all the tools, we'll just, we just won't build the house we want. And voting is one of the necessary tools. I think there were people go off, they veer off on the deep end is when they're like, voting is the tool that'll build the house. And you're like, my life has shown me that's not true. I voted my whole life and got dragged out of police department by my ankles. Right. You know, like I got the first person ever permanently banned from Twitter was banned for raising money to get me killed. Like voting didn't stop those things, right? Um, I also, to your to your larger point, when you think about the team, the teams remind me of businesses, right? Because they are businesses. Most businesses are really good residents and really bad neighbors, right? And like what a resident does is a resident says, I'm trying to take care of my house, right? I'm My, my lawn is 
cut. Like the people in my house are fed. Like people in my house are safe. What neighbors do is that they say the neighborhood is good, right? So a neighbor says, I might not even have kids, but I want the school down the street to be the best school it can be, right? A neighbor says, I'm not gay. I don't know queer people, but I know that that queer resource center down the street needs resources and should be safe. And like, that's my commitment as a neighbor. I want to make sure everybody in my neighborhood has what they need. And the teams have an opportunity not just to be good residents, right, which most businesses do really well. They have an opportunity to be good neighbors and say that the na- the only way to keep the neighborhood safe is if the police have less power, right? If the police aren't killing people, if the police aren't harming people, if we transition from Uh, a system that says that you need somebody with a gun to show up every time that there's harm, right? You don't need somebody with a gun to show up when there's a mental health crisis, right? Like neighbors say those sort of things. And we need uh, need more neighbors. What was your reaction when you heard about the uh, boycott, which which somehow grafted into uh, a postponement, but was a boycott. The Bucks decided not to play. And that was the third time and I think the second time in NBA history where Games had just been canceled like that. What was your reaction just hearing that they did that? So when I when I heard about the strike, I was uh, I was shocked. I was like, okay, okay. Like I saw the I, I saw the the still on Twitter of nobody walking out, and I was like, whoa. Uh, you know, when I think about, and then I got nervous, and I'm like, okay, I hope something comes out of it. Like you know, so I hope that 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 incredible amount of attention uh, turns turns into something systemic, because you know, the police don't have good responses for anything you lob their way. Like, it's not like they have some amazing response about why officers can't be interrogated immediately or something or qualified immunity. Like, they don't have it. So so I'm hopeful that, like, a set of demands comes out because the only negative response will be the police fear-mongering. Like, that is, that's it, you know? What do you say when, when people throw that at you? What's your response to that? What? When people say all the stuff you're doing, it's making people hate the police. Or like, if you were criticized for that, what would your response be? So we look at poll data, let's be clear, people, uh, the police favorability has not decreased. People still like the police, you know, it just hasn't, <laughs> hasn't happened. You look at the RNC and they, you would think that there was some full-fledged attack on the police. Remember the leading cause of death amongst police officers is suicide. People are not out here attacking the police, like that's not happening. And the police will tell you, you know, we did A Can't Wait. One of the criticisms we got is that people are like, this doesn't matter, we've already done this. It's like, A, we didn't do it already. But the police unions are still fighting us tooth and nail about these things. And these are basic. We're like, you shouldn't be able to choke somebody to death. In New York, um, in New York, there are like over 12 police unions that have come together to attack the mayor and the city council as they went and criminalized chokeholds. The unions are like, this will hamstring us. I can't believe you would say that we can't put our hands around people's necks. You're like, what? You know? So, so it doesn't make sense. And the more and more voices we have out there pushing on all of these fronts, like the better it is. So when people come to me with that, I'm like, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. The other thing I ask people is like, um, you know, when should the police be able to kill your child? Right? Right. Like, what is the, what's the moment when like they should be able to kill your child? Who, who is the you, the you for voter reform? Is there a you? Like all the stuff you've done, all the, like, I know me personally, I've learned so much just from all the work you guys have done uh, over the last six years. Not, I mean, not just the last three months. Um, is there a way to do that for voter reform? And do you feel like there's that kind of information? Does it exist? Is there a way for anybody to pull that off? Yeah, I do think that. I think I think there are a lot of good groups. You know, I'm on the board of Rock the Vote. Shout out to Rock the Vote. I think Rock the Vote does a great job. I think that generally on the left, um, what well, what we haven't figured out in terms of storytelling is like how to tell stories to like our family members. I think that like when you turn on some of the cable news, it's like the elites. It's like PhDs talking to PhDs all day about voting and all sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, not anybody talking to like somebody in your house right now who like you're trying to have a real conversation so like when we talk about no knock raids netta who's one of my partners you know she said something today she was like the us are breaking she said the police are breaking into people's house and i'm like you're right that's like the simplest way to talk about a no knock raid they literally are breaking into people's houses and like of course if somebody broke into your house you would try and stop them from breaking in you didn't know it was a police right and it's like that framing it's a break-in is something that i can tell i can tell anybody that like that is 
that to me is like a really good way to tell the story as opposed to being it's a raid where like the police officers didn't give a warning before they walked in and the battering ramp like you already aren't paying attention it's a break in got it right, right. Um, and I think that we just have to be better at like telling those stories in ways that like really resonate. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, last question. So if uh, if Biden wins in November, and we have a Democratic president, do you think that makes some of the stuff you're trying to do easier, or does it not make a difference? I think it makes it much easier because you know when we think about Biden, it's like Biden and, and Harris are obviously important, but they'll be appointing so many people. The cabinet, like the hundreds of appointees across uh, across the government will actually have an opportunity to help us on this stuff. And I think that it'll be a sea change. I think that there'll be a lot of movement. But again, the criminal justice stuff is pretty local. It's like still local. So Trump, um, Trump luckily has not had a big influence on like local things, yeah. like with regard to criminal justice. Uh, he has reinstituted the federal death penalty, which is a real nightmare. So the federal government will be able to stop that. But uh, But Biden and Harris will make it less hard for people to do good work, but still with criminal justice, it's like heavily local. Is that a possible evolution for you? Like being part of an administration like that, having some sort of job and really, and being on the inside? Probably not a job with them, but you know, we, we talked in most of the presidential campaigns uh, during campaign season. We yeah. sent over a set of recommendations. Some of them got adopted. Uh, some of them were still sort of pushing the administration on. So, uh, so I'm hopeful that they will do good. I think I, I want to stay on the outside right now, being able to like push the cities because that's where the big change is, yeah. you know? Makes sense. Well, it was great to see you. I appreciate it uh, being educated as always by you. you always, <laughs> you're one of the best experts that I think we have on. You just, you just full command. I don't know how you do it. Um, oh, I pod save it. the people. Go to next to six. Oh, yeah. Do pod save the people. Hold on. Let's Go do ahead. this again. Kyle, edit this. Let me do it again. All right. So the pod save the people podcast. What else do you have to promote? I uh, go to nix to six.org, uh, which is about police unions and officer bill of rights. And then we did this cool podcast with Jay Ellis. I think, you know, Jay, yeah. you know, Jay, yep, yeah, Dan insecure. We did a four part limited series podcast called the untold story policing. That also is about police unions. That's not boring. It's very cool. And it helps you see why this is a big issue. So check it out. And hashtag eight can't wait. Eight can't wait.org. Don't forget about that as well. <laughs> you got a lot of stuff going on. No, Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Cool. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.